Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number five. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. All right, automotive enthusiasts, I am extremely excited to introduce my special guest today, Dave Bowman. Dave, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? You bet, Mark. I'm ready to go. All right. It is great to have you here. Dave is a very popular television personality and has spent more than 20 years in automotive television broadcasting. For 15 years, he pioneered the automotive how-to television shows, beginning with Shade Tree Mechanic. He went on to create and co-host Crank and Chrome, High Rev Tuners, Truck Universe, and Two Guys Garage with Sam Amolo. For the last four years, Dave has rejoined his longtime buddy Sam to host Motorhead Garage on the Velocity Network. Dave is a member of SAE. He's a former ASE certified auto mechanic and former Indy 500 race mechanic. And to say that Dave's a car guy is a huge understatement. So Dave, I've told our listeners a little bit about you. So take a moment and share some more of your history, your interests, and your passion for automobiles. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've always been interested in cars and, uh, Unfortunately, my family never really was, uh, they were, my father or anybody wasn't really into cars or anything, so I was sort of a, an outcast, I guess, but my grandfather had uh, an interest in it. In fact, he worked uh, at Stutz back in 19, oh, late 1920s, you know, worked, uh, he actually had some interesting jobs there, but he worked for a fellow by the name of Bert Dingley, who ran Stutz at the time, and Dingley was an old Indy car racer he raced in the 1913 indianapolis 500 so uh, and then he went on and become um uh, went to a, another company called marmon harrington and my grandfather went with him so my grandfather was interest was uh, really involved in the early early stages of the automotive industry when uh you know in indianapolis at the time was the detroit of of cars before detroit became detroit of cars and so I guess I got my uh, a lot of my uh, interest uh, from him, him telling me stories and so forth. But uh, I've always been uh, uh, into cars and never really had the opportunity to get into it to any depth until really uh, I got into high school and I was re- always following the races. And then when I went to college, uh, I went to school in Indianapolis and there I had an opportunity to be closer to the racetrack and, you know, one thing after another led and uh that's how i got started into racing and then of course that once you're in the racing why that kind of branches out into other areas of the cars as well so and as i got older i kind of like the older cars and the collectibles and this type of thing so that's kind of how it came about what got you into television uh well i always tell everybody it was just sheer talent and good looks but <laughs> of course it was through it either case <laughs> Uh, it, actually it was by accident. It's not something I'd planned on doing, but, uh, the long and the short of it was that I was working for Fram at the time and I was involved, uh, that was Fram oil filters. And, um, uh, I was involved with doing, uh, setting up training programs and conducting clinics. And, um, they had, uh, they'd always hired a, a, a media spokesperson to go out and represent them. And, we had uh, several, and uh, one of them that they had didn't work out as well as they had hoped. And so somebody said, well, hell, let's let Dave try it. And so I did, and they uh, gave me some media training. And uh, it turned out I ended up becoming their media spokesperson for oh, most of my career there at Fram. And that led into other things. Uh, I got more involved in doing the media, and I was on the av- doing some advertising. I was working on the advertising department then. And um, we had the a, a, a guy I worked for, my boss, uh, always saying, I wish we could do a show on mechanics. And we had sponsored a show on PBS called Last Chance Garage. And it was done out of Boston on, w, on the uh, Boston PBS station up there. The only problem with it is that uh, with PBS, you couldn't really show much of your product. You know, they were always wanting to be very pure. And it kind of got to the point where somebody was, Finally, questioning, you know, why are we spending money if we can't show our product? 
so I worked on the show with them as a technical advisor for the for the host, and eventually my uh, boss said, "I wish we could do a show on mechanics." Well, having been an IndyCar mechanic, I realized and knew there was a whole background that nobody's ever talked about or seen. They always focus on the driver, and that's it. And nobody ever talks about the guys behind the scenes. So I said, "I think I know how to do a show like that." And uh, presented I t- it to him, and uh, the idea was a show that it evolved into a show called Hidden Heroes. And it was on TNN, and TNN was in their infancy, and we put a deal together with them, and Fran bought the time, and we put uh, Hidden Heroes on there. It became a very, very good media buy for uh, Fram. And it's something I learned about advertising. If you control the media, you control the message. And that worked out very well. And uh, so we did that for five years. We went behind the scenes and st- spent a weekend with a, a race team. And uh, whatever happened, happened. And uh, sometimes they won. Most of the time they didn't win. But uh, I think we did have a winner once in a while, but uh, rarely. But the idea was to capture the struggle and what life was like behind the uh, team. So we did a ton of people in NASCAR and IndyCar, drag racing, sprint car racing, off-road. Uh, we even did... Um, uh, unlimited hydroplanes and the Reno air races one time. So we did a show, uh, we did the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. So we did a lot of different uh, teams and uh, had a great experience doing that. That was reality TV before reality t- TV really started. Yeah, it was because uh, back then, this was back in the uh, mid 80s. And, you know, uh, television or uh, racing on television was somewhat non-existent and ESPN and uh, TNN for instance uh, you know they started picking up the NASCAR stuff because they needed content and so they uh, were able to do that and that really is what helped propel you know NASCAR to the forefront because they had a television package although it was on cable you know they were on every weekend somewhere and then so cable really helped propel uh, propel uh, motorsports on television like nothing else has well, that's really tremendous because showing those, or rather having those how-to shows on television for automotive enthusiasts to be able to just see a guy in a garage or mechanics working and doing what just came naturally uh, was something new and novel at the time. And now you turn on Velocity or you go to YouTube and you can see thousands of these kinds of things happening. So you really were a pioneer back then for sure. Well, you know, we you probably couldn't do that same show that we did back then of Hidden Heroes because of, uh, you know, the race teams, the, the uh, uh, all the media stuff that goes on now. I mean, it's a whole different ball game, so we were able to do that. But uh, we moved on from there, and uh, this was uh, a little bit more of uh, how we got into the how-to shows. Uh, I was working, again, I was working for Fram. It was part of uh, Allied Signal at the time, which is a major corporation. And what I found out was uh, sometimes being successful sort of outside of the company, uh, doing company things, uh, may not always work well for you, especially with some of your immediate supervisors. <laughs> and so, anyway, I reached a point where it was um, I could see my career probably not going a whole lot farther there. So we had an idea for a new show, and they didn't want to listen to it. So I said, okay. So I took it outside, and I had a partner. Uh, in fact, the fellow I worked for um, in Fram, he'd retired. And so I went to him, and I asked him, I said, hey, you want to do some more TV? And he says, oh, yeah. So uh, bottom line is we put a deal together and put Shade Tree together and went to TNN. They liked it, wanted to work with us. So it took us about a year and a half to two years to sell the idea. But we got it, got a sponsor, and uh, STP was our first sponsor, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And uh, But it was enough to get it on the air and to show that the network could sell the time. And so we started with Shade Tree Mechanic. It was produced by Cinetel Productions in Knoxville, Tennessee. And, um, you know, we never thought it would, you know, we thought maybe we'd get a couple of years out of it. And who knows? Well, that went on for eight years. Oh, my goodness. And then it was in rerun during that time and... and Reran for I think another couple of years after that, and uh, become a real you know one of the first t- uh, how-to TV shows, automotive t- TV shows on television. And uh, then you know a couple of years later, then other companies started producing shows similar. And um, you know it's kind of like having the only McDonald's franchise in town. You do okay, but if somebody puts a Wendy's down the street from you, it'll double your business. <laughs> you know how that works. Yes, exactly. So, uh, so it really justified it and helped open up a whole new, uh, really a 
uh, opportunity for the performance market and the automotive aftermarket to advertise on television, which, you know, they, they weren't that big. So they couldn't afford to do the big network buys, but you take a lot of the small performance manufacturers out there. Uh, their, their only advertising was in the print media, and now this opened up television for them that they could afford, and it was highly targeted. I mean, it was right to the uh, right to their source. So, so it worked out very, very well, and of course now you got whole networks uh, devoted to car shows. And- it's just exploded. It's so fun to hear your story and how it evolved, and part of your story struck with me was uh, what I guess they call today a pivot in the sense that you said you had an idea and the people around you weren't so sure about it, so you went out and did it on your own. I interviewed David Bull of David Bull Publishing the other day, and exact same thing. He was working for a publishing company. He had some ideas. They said, no, this is the way we always do stuff. So he went out and created a whole new business, and that's exactly what you did as well. So part of the show, Dave, we like to have you... Tell the listeners about a success quote or a mantra that means something to you. This is a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So, Dave, take the wheel. All right. Yeah, I had, there was two, and they could come from two different but very, very interesting people that I ran across years ago when I was involved, uh, actively involved in racing. I worked for Peter Revson uh, back in 1969 on the Can-Am series. And uh, Peter was quite a guy, and he was always walking around, and when things got tough. He said, oh, you got to persevere. You have to persevere. And I always remembered that. That was a kind of a, I don't know if that was his favorite saying, but I picked it up that he was always saying that. And it helped when uh, when you got your old dauber down, why uh, he'd come around, you got to persevere. Hey, you got to persevere. I said, okay, I can remember that. And that's always worked. The other one was when I was doing Hidden Heroes, we did a show with uh, Roger Penske. And at that time, he owned the old Nazareth Speedway, and uh, we did the show out there, and I think Emerson Fittipaldi, or I know Rick Mears was the driver, and no, Rick Mears and Danny Sullivan were the drivers then. And uh, I remember there was a sign over the gate that led to the garage area there, and it says, effort equals results. And I think that's Roger's favorite saying. And I re- always remember that. I thought, boy, does that ever ring true? So those two things have always been something I've always kind of remembered when you get down and uh, get frustrated and and uh, or, or depressed. Why I kind of pull those up and think, you know what? I got to work a little harder. So oh, those, those, two, those are the two things I always remember. Those are great, very inspirational quotes. And I'll, I'll remind our listeners, you can go to carsyad.com and download a free filler up PDF book. And in that book, there are some wonderful images of uh, filler caps, gas filler caps from old cars, but also some great quotes from some famous people in the automotive industry. And I'm going to add those to that book because those are two fantastic quotes that you shared with us. Dave, can you tell us how you've incorporated those quotes, that mantra into your life over the years and your passion for cars? Well, um, yeah, I think it's not something you think about all the time. It's just something I I think that's uh, kind of becomes ingrained in you. And, uh, when you know, one of the things I st- when I started out in uh, after I got out actively out of racing and I got into the corporate world, one of my goals was I wanted to uh, run a motorsports program for a major corporation. And um, you know, for a long time, I did a lot of things on my own. Just you know, I had a backdoor racing program when I was with Fram and uh, Autolite spark plugs at the time. And no funding or anything, but I just was out working and trying to get things lined up. And I was able to get obsolete spark plugs that were racing plugs that worked. And I gave those to, um, you know, a lot of uh, different racing teams and established a relationship there. I never knew where it was going to go, but I always remember telling my wife that, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, it's all going to pay off. Well, it eventually did because we ended up having, uh, Fram ended up setting up the motorsports program. But they never ever could figure out how they got all these top uh, racing teams, especially in drag racing and in the world of outlaws, automatically with them right off the bat. What they never knew was that had already been done several years prior to <laughs> out of the back door. So, you know, uh, it can get frustrating because you're trying to accomplish something that nobody is really wanting to buy yet. But somewhere along the line, uh, the light will come on and then, you know, it'll work for you. So. You know, those are the things where uh, those kind of, that little mantra there would uh, help sustain you and keep you going forward. 
persevere for sure. That's yeah. always a always something to have in your back pocket and be thinking yeah. of. Uh, listeners love to hear a little bit more about your history. Is there a pivotal moment in your life that you realized I am a car guy? Uh, no, there's not a pivotal moment. Uh, I was always a car guy. I didn't know anything other than that. So you were born a car guy. Uh, I was, yeah. I mean, uh, I can my uh, I remember when I was just a little kid, man. I lived for the month of May in the Indy Five Hundred, and I was a, I was a race guy more than just a car collector type of guy or a hot rodder. I was a race guy, and uh, I always wanted to go race, and that's all I could ever think about. Of course, that today, back then in the fifties and the sixties, while growing up wanting to go racing, that was kind of like wanting to run off and go to the circus or something. You know? <laughs> it wasn't uh, a uh, thing that made you popular with your family, so to speak. Yeah, mom didn't want to hear that, did she? No. And uh, so the uh, the moment that came when I realized that I had to, that it was like a pivotal moment for me was when I was in college and I was a junior and I was going to be a teacher and a coach because that was a safe thing to say, hey, I'm going to be a teacher and a coach. Oh, Eric, that's great. We think that's wonderful. As opposed to saying, no, I want to go racing because <laughs> that just wasn't popular. And uh, I was at, uh, at a high school where we had a teacher's orientation where I was going to take my practice teaching. And I sat through that for about a day and a half, maybe two days. And I remember... I got up at noon, went to lunch, and never came back. I realized that there's no way I could do that, but I had an opportunity to go go to the Speedway, and I decided, you know what, I'm going racing. I quit school. I went racing, and it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Now, I did go back and finish college and got my degree, but once that opportunity opened, that door opened for me to go, I didn't turn it down. I took off and, and grabbed it. And that that changed everything. That's my big aha moment, if you call it that. Not unlike a racer that sees an opening in the corner and he just goes for it. He has to. That's his big yeah, break. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, good analogy there. Dave, uh, what I want to do here is take a look a little bit more into your journey, uh, the roads that you've driven down, and really crawl under the hood and maybe get your hands a little dirty. I'd like you to share a huge challenge you faced, whether it be in a business ad- adventure or endeavor, or a specific automotive project that really pushed you past your breaking point and how you overcame that situation? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, there's uh, there's several that come to mind. I guess, I think the one, especially if uh, in business, it's a whole other story, but I think uh, from the automotive side of it, I remember we were doing, I was doing a show called, uh, we were doing Two Guys Garage. I started that years ago, and it's still on, by the way. This was uh, when we started that. And we were doing a, uh, a series of shows with Holly, with Holly Carburetors. And they had come up with a, uh, a performance kit. And it had like four, three or four stages to it. So you could take a, and this was with a big block Chevy, a 454. And they had John Lingenfelter, who was a well-known engine builder and racer. They had him doing the development work for him, so that you wanted to have a 454 and you wanted to put a uh, Holly carburetor on there, and you could do that a kit with a carburetor and let's say an intake manifold and headers. You'll generate X amount more horsepower. Then, if you wanted to step it up more, well, then they had a cam that had been developed for that combination, so you could keep adding to this, and all the dyno work had been done. So. You know, when you got done, if you wanted to go the maximum route with uh, heads and uh, the whole deal, you know, you could develop over 400 and some horsepower with it at the wheels. That was the deal. And so we did this show that we were going to do these different levels. And uh, it was a pretty involved show to do because of all the pre-work you had to do. And we wanted to show the car and run it at these different levels, stock and get the horsepower and then start adding these things on and run it and see what horsepower we got at each level. And we did that. We got down to the final show, and here Lingenfelder had developed these special heads for it, which would complete the whole project. And uh, so he had put this engine together and dynoed it and got all the numbers and everything and then sent it down, and we took it apart and then put it back together for the show. And... We're getting the right numbers. Well, the last show, we put it together, and we've been thrashing. We couldn't get the engine to run. 
Oh, no. Oh, my God. What are we doing? And we worked and worked and worked. And here you got a crew standing around and shooting. And, and you know what it's like. You've, you've, you've been there. And uh, so we just finally called a halt, figure out what the heck's going on here. Well, in this whole thrash, we had made some mistakes. And Holly wanted a new manifold on there because the one we had was looking a little shop-worn. So we put that on there. Well, we found out that we needed to elongate the holes on the bolt for the bolts because it didn't sit didn't sit flat. And you got to do that anyway on them, but we didn't. And so we had a vacuum leak. So we got that corrected, and we found some other problems that we had uh, had created for ourselves and got everything corrected, and everything was fine, and uh, run the thing up on the dyno to see if we could get our numbers because we want to get the numbers before we shot it. Of course, yes. And uh, so we ran it up, and it still wouldn't run up. I mean, you just couldn't get the horsepower. It would run, but it just didn't feel like it was getting the horsepower. So I called John. I said, John, I said, what number? What did you do on this thing? I mean, we can't seem to get the numbers. We had everything he had on it, back on there. Everything was fine. No leaks, no nothing. The timing, everything was set. Went through the whole deal. He says, I don't know. He says, uh, it sh- you should be getting about you know 400-some horsepower. I said, well, we ain't getting it. So I don't know, like a lot of guys, you know, you sit there and you just stare at something and you think something will come to you over a period of time. <laughs> It'll whole, just magically repair yeah, itself. Right. And, but that did happen. And it was exasperating because we had worked for a week or, on this thing or two. And uh, everything went fine until this last shoot. Well, I was looking at the carburetor and I happened to notice written on the carburetor, John had written 800, 800 and some feet on it. I thought, oh, Crap, now I know exactly what the problem is. He's in Decatur, Indiana. We're in Tampa, Florida, which is about 11 feet above sea level. Different elevation. Oh, my God, yeah. I went and uh, took another carburetor off the shelf, a brand new one, put it on there, and it had Richard, much Richard Jets in the thing. It was written up. Put it on there, fired it up, ran the dyno, boom, got her number. Well, sometimes the answer is steering you in the face, and that carburetor sitting right on top of that motor was steering you right in the face. That was a challenging, challenging time, uh, and then we finally got a shot. John came down for that final shoot, then, and it was great that he came down. Well, that's a great story, gosh. How many times have we been trying to get something to work, and it's right there in front of your face? It finally pops through, so I appreciate you sharing that. That's a wonderful story. Dave, let's shift gears and go to the other end of the spectrum and share a story when you had an aha moment in your business, your career, and then the steps you took to change that. And I know you spoke a little of that earlier when you got into television, but can you pinpoint one point where your mind just went, oh, this is where I want to go with my career, with my life? Boy, uh, I, I guess I can say that when I was with Fram, um, I had been doing the television show with uh, with them, with uh, Hidden Heroes, and that, and of course, doing the uh, media stuff for them. And then we were doing the um, uh, national sales conferences, and I do the media stuff with that. But I never considered television as a career at all. And we were working with a uh, production company that did a lot of the um, the sales conference and that kind of stuff over in Orlando. And the guy that ran it, a super nice guy, he kept telling me, he says, you know, you really ought to think about going into television. Well, that's the last thing I ever thought about doing. I mean, not me. And uh, finally, I reached kind of that point of exasperation that uh, I realized my career was going nowhere at Fram because there there wasn't anything ahead of me that I really wanted to do. And uh, the motorsports thing was kind of... I'd reached my peak with that, where we could go. So I thought, you know, when they uh, didn't want to have share some of my other TV ideas, I thought, well, you know what? I think I'm going to do it. And But it meant leaving the corporate world and that whole security that they have in the corporate world. You know what that's all about, Mark. Oh, yeah. You had a you had that entrepreneurial moment, and you took, you took a leap. Well, I know where I can go here and I can't see any real future there, it must be better outside. So I think that's when I decided that uh, I would resign from, uh, actually retire from Fram. And I got with my uh, old partner that, and my former boss at Fram and he and I formed a partnership and uh, we decided let's go shoot television. And my wife was working at the time and and she still does, but she was working. And I says, uh, we talked about, I says, well, 
let's take the shot. Let's take the chance. And if you don't get a chance or take a chance, you don't get a chance, you know. And uh, so we did, and that's what happened. Luckily, it all worked out. So. Well, absolutely. certainly has worked out. What was your uh, very first car, Dave? And maybe you can share one or two stories about what made that car special for you, maybe some modifications you did to it, adventures, memories. I see a big smile on your face. My first car was a 57 Ford Fairlane 500 convertible. Oh, wow. And uh, I paid 750 bucks for it. I bought it, uh, I think, after my freshman year in college. And I had it about, uh, I don't know, about two weeks, I think. And then I uh, radically modified it by uh, running in the back of somebody and tearing the front end off. <laughs> now, that's a hard way to modify a vehicle. But it's quick. It's quick, man. It happened. Anyway, it wasn't a big, it wasn't real bad, but uh, we put a new doghouse on it and repainted it. And actually, it was a chance to really kind of fix the car up. So, so we did. And that was my very, that was for my very first car. Oh, fantastic. I wish I had it back. Well, that's the next question. Seller's remorse. Is there a car that you've sold in your past that you wish you had back? I think you just answered the question. Well, that's one of them. Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, there's a uh, 57 Ford. Um, there was a uh, 66 Mustang GT that I wish I had back. Oh, yes. And there's a, a 67 Jaguar uh, XKE Roadster that I restored that uh, I wish I had that one back. And then uh, let me think what else. Uh, well, I had a, a 73 uh, Pinto. And I wouldn't mind have. I'd love to have one of those back. Now, I know they had a bad rap, but. They were the best car for the money you could get, man. You could run the daylights out of them, and they were easy to fix. They're, they had nice power and good room, and they were just fun to drive. A friend in high school that had one, and we used to load our surfboards up on the top and go down to Baja, California, and camp on the beach, and that car never let us down. Are there any projects that you're working on right now, Dave, that really have you excited and fired up? Uh, actually... Yeah, but they're not any car projects, believe it or not. I uh, I still like to mess around. I got um, I got an old Champ Silver Crown car that I restored. Oh, beautiful! And, and I uh, I still mess around with that occasionally. But actually, I've kind of gotten off the car kick because I don't have any room for it. But uh, started building flintlock pistols. Oh and, goodness! And it's a whole different thing, but it, uh, it's just a lot of fun to uh, to do. But uh, and you get into the history of it and the history of the of the guys who the old gun masters back in the seventeenth, uh, eighteenth century. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm uh, I'm making a replica of one that was uh, built in Indiana. So I'm kind of into that. It's easier to do now. Yeah, super, Dave. We go. We're getting into a part of the show I like to call the last lap. And this is where I fire off a series of questions, and you give our listeners very quick blip of the throttle answers. So are you ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. What is the best automotive advice you ever received? Never buy a new car. Buy a used one. The reason for that is you don't take the uh, depreciation hit. Of course. Smart man. Smart man. Can you share one of your personal habits that you believe contributes to your success? Yeah, I think it's always show up. You know, I've always heard somebody say that, and it's really true. Always show up. Be there. If you got a job, be there and do it. And don't be afraid to take a chance. I said earlier, you don't get a chance unless you take a chance. And uh, take the chance and ride that wave as far as you can. That's great advice. Do you have a resource that you'd like to share with our listeners? Maybe a website, a restoration shop, suppliers, or a person that you really value? Uh, website I usually go to is the, uh, believe it or not, the National Speed Sport News. That's one of my favorites. Uh, in terms of uh, restoration, uh, there's a, there's, I got several friends who are involved in the restoration business, and I love to go stop in to see the, at their shops when I'm in town and just catch up on what they're doing and seeing what they're restoring. And it's, you know, it's fabulous. You can spend the whole day there talking to them and looking at some of the old old cars, especially the old race cars and things. But, Is there a book that you might share with our listeners that you've recently enjoyed? Actually, yeah, there's two books that uh, that I really like. And if you're if you really um, are into it, uh, one book I just finished not long ago called Go Like Hell. 
and it's the story of um, Ford, Henry Ford, and Enzo Ferrari, and that whole battle of between Ford and Ferrari and uh, running at Le Mans. And uh, it's a fabulous book. If you, anybody wants to get it, it, it will give you a real insight of what, what was going on there. And the other one is called, and it's an old book, but I'm sure you probably can find it somewhere. It's called Gentlemen, Start Your Engine. And it was a story of Wilbur Shaw, who was the, um, I think, the first one of the uh, a three-time winner. I don't know if he's the first one or not, but he was uh, he was a three-time winner in the Indianapolis 500 and saved the uh, Speedway after the war. But it's the story of him and the early days of racing. If you want to find out what it was really like back in the early days of racing, that's a fabulous book. It'll give you a real insight of what it took and what they did. Well, what we'll do, listeners, is we'll post these up on the Cars Yeah website, and you can find these listed under the show notes for Dave. Just log into carsyeah.com slash Dave Bowman, and we'll post those up there and see if we can't find that second book somewhere out there in the in the archives. All right. Well, Dave, you've taken us on a, a great ride, and I've so enjoyed your stories. I really appreciate you sharing your life with us and sharing all these adventures you've had in your life. Uh it's just tremendous. I wondered if you could give our listeners one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset and let our listeners know what is the best way they can learn more about you. Well, I guess the best way to learn more about me would be to uh, watch our show on Velocity Network. You see Sam and I struggling there with <laughs> car projects and whatever. Um, as far as any parting advice, I guess the the only parting advice I have was would be to... Um, Enjoy life, follow your dream, and uh, keep a positive attitude about everything. That's great. Thank you, Dave, for being so generous with your time and your expertise and, and sharing your stories with our listeners. Until we talk again, we'll see you down the road. Okay, Mark. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!